Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Neutrality Studies Analysis Podcast. I'm joined today by the founder of Neutrality Studies and professor, or assistant professor of international relations at Kyoto University, Dr. Pascal Otaz. Uh, welcome to your own channel, Pascal. <laughs> Thank you very much, John, for the kind introduction and for everybody. We are just introducing this new format. So excuse the two of us if we're having a little bit of fun today, we're, because we are really trying out what is possible in this podcast format. And I'm very much looking forward to it, John. Uh, yes, uh, myself likewise. And I'm really looking forward to reading through your comments and seeing how you receive the new format. There's obviously going to be a lot of minor adjustments and tweaks before we get this, you know, smooth but if you can bear with us today uh then we have a lot to cover don't we we do we do uh, and i think the first thing you prepared is actually an analysis an analysis of the situation in syria uh, yes that's correct so if you've been following the news you'll notice that it's all kicked off in syria again we had the war's been going on since 2011 so it's approaching its 14th year now, which is incredible and disastrous, of course. Uh, so the news is that as of last week, the Herat Tahrir al-Sham has launched its northwestern offensive uh, and captured a lot of territory from the Syrian government. Uh, they've named their offensive Operation Deterrence of Aggression, which shows that someone's been learning from the West in nomenclature, if not in tactics. So let's just cover what's happening in Syria and why. And pull up the first map here. We have the Northwestern Offensive front lines from live map uh, as of the 29th. And we can see as we go forward that there has been a major breakout from uh, HTS, Herat Tahrir al-Sham's position in the northwest of Syria. They've come out of that Idlib province and seemingly just swept all before them. And if we go to the situation in December, we can see that Aleppo has been completely occupied by rebels for the first time ever in the Syrian civil war. What the, this is, this comes as a huge surprise, right? I mean, nobody saw this one coming or did you, did you hear about any rumors beforehand that Aleppo was actually somehow under threat? Uh, no, I mean, it was Aleppo is the second largest city in Syria. You would imagine it's a real top priority for the Assad government to maintain control of. And they managed to do so throughout every offensive and every adversity that they faced up until now. So what exactly it was that precipitated this collapse, whether it was new tactics or equipment on the side of the rebels, whether it was a depletion of the fighting capability of Assad's forces or his economy. Uh, whatever it was, it seems to have really changed the game in Syria. Um, to me, this came this came as a huge surprise. And I know we will probably um, get to this in a moment, but the fact that it happens more or less simultaneously with the ceasefire in Lebanon, um, mm -hmm. that you have one conflict, at least to some extent, winding down and another one then happening here that that is quite suspicious to me but um maybe we we continue with what you have prepared yes i think so i think it, we have to mention that the fact that this offensive started seemingly on the very day that israel signed its ceasefire with lebanon uh, obviously everything is so interconnected in this region and that uh, you can only suspect that there's there's some kind of link there uh so the first question that I asked myself when seeing the Kurds and the, the Kurds, the SDF in the north represented in yellow here, uh, and Herat Tahrir al-Sham, both advancing on Aleppo from two sides with the government forces withdrawing, was what would happen when the two forces come into contact with each other? Would they fall into infighting or did they have some kind of agreement? Um, and we can see what happened very clearly here. The rebel forces had a lot more firepower clearly than the Kurds and simply took the territory that the Kurds had walked into and told them to leave. Um, now, this there's obviously a few things going on here. So the Turkish backed in light green, the SNA, Syrian National Army, have been advancing from the north to straight to the south. The HTS have been advancing this way and this way. And so the Kurds who 
advanced into this territory and around Aleppo and actually arrived first at Aleppo airport, among other locations, were essentially surrounded and forced to leave. They signed an agreement or agreed verbally with Herat Tudel al-Sham that they would withdraw to their main territory over here. But really, what this represents is the occupation of a massive amount of Kurdish-occupied northern Syria by non-Kurdish rebel forces, which is obviously a humanitarian crisis in the making. Yeah, and and if we if we if we call them rebel forces, I mean that's that's the way that Western media uh, talks about them regularly. But we are talking here about quite quite some extremist Islamist. Uh, uh, fighters, right? And there were horrible, there was at least one very horrible video of a beheading that these forces did during the first one, first or so two, one or two days. And these are not exactly the kind of people that the, that the Kurds have wanted on their territories un- so far, at least as far as I understand. Is that about correct? Yeah, I think so. It's so Herat Tarir al Sham are a, a very interesting organization because, I mean, they. They draw their inheritance from Al-Qaeda and Al-Nusra, but I think it would be unfair to say that they are exactly the same. There has been this great movement to sort of rebrand their image, uh, to be less, uh, to be more Western friendly, perhaps, uh, in terms of what they do and what they believe. But there's certainly an Islamist backbone, I think, to them. How extreme that is, is up for debate, but uh, yeah, he, then you've got the Syrian National Army who are absolutely supported to the hilt by Turkey. And they are, because Turkey and the Kurdish population have a long and storied history, I think you could say that the the Kurds will, are reluctant to be occupied by that force, shall we say. Um, the, so, the, mm-hmm. Sorry, just like the... the the Kurdish held territories are uh, are something that the Turkish government hates to see, isn't it? This is something that Erdogan has been opposing and something where Erdogan mm. has been on loggerheads also with the, the the US forces over there who have been collaborating with the Kurds since, well, maybe not since day one, but that have come to be the major backing, like great power behind them. Um, is this also to some extent a... Um, you know, an escalation of Turkey against the U.S. coalition forces. I think it's hard to to take it that far. Turkey has been very active militarily, by the looks of it, but not in areas where the U.S.-backed coalition is strong. Uh, there have been some Turkish strikes in the far eastern part, but very limited in scale. And that's obviously not where all the territorial changes are happening. The real news story of Syria is not these bits around the side, but the occupation of this territory and the fall of Aleppo to Herat Tahrir al-Sham. Now, I think it's important to ask why the rebels or the Islamists have achieved so much sudden success. And uh, I think there's two, there's three questions we can ask here. So the first and most obvious one is, how far will the offensive go? Uh, it seemed like they swept all before them in the first few days. This conflict is only a week old at the time of recording for this offensive, rather. And it seems that the rebels have only been stopped north of Hama, which is a, a sizable distance from the original border. And they were herring their way down to towards Damascus right from the start. So the question is, will Syria and its allies be able to stop the rebels at this point and stabilize a conflict here? Or will there be further collapses and territorial changes on either side? Uh, It's very hard to appraise that without having a full and in-depth knowledge of the military situation on the ground, which, as we're just getting the news as it's breaking, is obviously quite difficult to do. So the next question is, why is the Syrian army collapsing so quickly. And I think we can we can start to speculate on a few things here. Maybe now is the time to talk about Lebanon briefly, because we have a whole segment on Lebanon following this one. Um, so it's well known that Bashar al-Assad's government and his forces 
are supported in Syria by a number of other factors, uh, proxies or allies, depending on your, your uh, choice of nomenclature. And one of these is Hezbollah. And Hezbollah has, of course, been very weakened by two months of bombardment by Israel. And so this, while I can't verify this from direct reports on the ground, two arguments that I've heard in support of why Assad's army is so weak here compared to what it was uh, just a few years ago. One of them is that a lot of Hezbollah fighters and equipment have been withdrawn from the Syrian arena into Lebanon to help repel the Israeli incursion or to fight against Israel as a result of the October the 7th uh, attacks and the war against Palestine since last year. And the other argument is that because of the intensity of that conflict, Assad himself was obliged to withdraw his own units from the north part of Syria towards the Israeli border in case there was a significant overspill on the ground from Israeli forces. Now, I can't verify either of these arguments, but I think they're both logical. What's your instinct on hearing that, Pascal? This would make sense because the largest question has been why this once formidable fighting force that um, held even at the time when Aleppo was fought over like very intensely and in, I think in 2000 around 2015 um, there was like very um, strong fighting and this, the Syrian uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad's forces never actually lost control over the citadel domain this 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 most fortified and, and old one of the old parts of Aleppo. Um, while now they just completely uh, uh, collapsed and, and withdrew and, and and gave up, and there wasn't there wasn't a lot of fighting going on in the first place. Now the element of surprise, of course, was huge, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, then um, why why as you said in the introduction, why would the second most important city not be prop uh, proper properly defended? So mm -hmm. that it has to do with Lebanon. That it has to do with the fact that overall Hezbollah and the the forces, um, Assad's forces in, in Syria and also then um, Iran are actually a part of the same system that obviously has been degraded for one reason or another by the by what has happened in, in Lebanon, thus um, would make a lot of sense. The other explanatory explanation is would, of course, be that um, horrible mismanagement happened, right? I've heard this on other podcasts that one of the major frustrations of the Russians who are the great power backers of the uh, of the Assad government and and its forces um, are actually very frustrated. Um, not so much with the with the Turks or even with uh, with Israel, but uh, very much with their own ally, Syria, who hasn't managed to to, um, to root out some for forms of systemic corruption inside the fighting mm -hmm. force. Now, also this one is pure conjecture. I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is the guesses on the ground, but it's actually probably likely that it's a combination of those factors uh, going hand in hand. Then again, like um, if you ask me what is the most immediate cause, I would put my money on the the way that uh, the Syrian forces were were working with Hezbollah on on what on whatever mm -hmm. level, and that indeed the the degrading of Hezbollah is now also a has the secondary effect of having uh, impacted Syria is this the Syrian armed forces very heavily. Yeah, I think that's that's very good analysis, and you can't discount the potential of corruption. Obviously, we're, we're not basing this on journalistic evidence, which I think is pretty scarce regarding the internal organization of the Syrian Arab army, um, but it's certainly a possibility to consider here. On the other side of the coin, there's not just the argument of uh, how is Assad's army suddenly so weak, but also perhaps how is how are the rebels suddenly so strong? And the question there is who or what turned these rebels into an effective fighting force over the last four years? Um, and if you're to speculate on what weapons or equipment might have been supplied or who would be involved, what regional power players would have an interest in this kind of development, uh, who would you suspect of that kind of thing? Well, I mean, uh, without without any proof of this i would just say one logical thing to happen here would be that actually there are some western supplied uh uh techno there's western supplied technology involved here and we've seen this time and again 
how uh, the US and also Europe act were actively involved in kind of clandestine operations to prop up any kind of enemy of your enemy, right? Even mm. at the expense uh, of those then potentially becoming uh, the next ISIS, literally, or the, yes. the you know, the, the Taliban in Afghanistan um in in the 19 in the 1980s right the this this um using of proxies in order to weaken a primary a primary enemy has long history again also here i have nothing to actually that i could that i could like point to a document oh, or a course. memo um we we have now discussions about the weapons that we are seeing being deployed um of which, which some seem to point toward um western equipment or at least also uh, actually turkish uh, equipment to so to some extent um, maybe did you find in your research any any indications for such so, so i found nothing that you could describe as a smoking gun and obviously as i'm not an expert in military equipment i can't say from the photos that i have found uh what equipment is what i do have a photo which i'd like to bring up in a second uh, if i can work out how to do it of uh, a photo taken by the rebels in aleppo having captured uh, what they claim to be a russian panzer II system um, and a lot of them are wearing what looks like pretty reasonable equipment including combat helmets with the GoPro slots that you often see on the more modern ones. And I do, I was wondering whether we, our audience could take a look at that and see if they recognize any of the gear in that photo and work out whether it's been captured from the, uh, from the Assad army or whether it's been supplied by some other power. So we'll bring that up in a second when we work out how to do that. Uh, but the other thing, which I think is really important is that the, the rebels have been using a lot of drones in this stage of the conflict, which we haven't seen before. Uh, so, if we can yeah, although like while little... you're looking for the picture, I mean, the drone drone mm -hmm. warfare is one of the largest revolutions of military warfare that we have seen uh, over the past. Um, uh, I would say three years. Drone warfare was not a thing before the the Ukrainian conflict blew up into its full scale uh, since uh, 2022, and mm -hmm. then suddenly it became clear that these drones changed the entire strategic game on the ground of art artillery um, forces. Right? It's not so much their impact as a replacement for for missile systems, but as ways of surveillance of the of the territory. Funnily enough, very similar to the the way the balloons actually started um, changing warfare back in the in the uh, late nineteenth century, that you could just see what is happening. And um, I think you know, um, this this drone warfare that it now happens again this time is something that probably was to be more is more expected as drones in any new uh, conflict theater will become big. And uh, one more point about them, though, is that you don't necessarily need uh, a large manufacturing base for this, right? These drones, especially the ones the Ukrainians have been using, were like uh, Chinese manufactured uh, 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 commercial drones, the ones that you and I, we can buy in any kind of hardware mm -hmm. store, uh, um, IT store, and they, they, they then reconfigure them in order to carry bombs and bomblets and so on and, 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 and surveil an area, which is quite, uh, it's quite fantastic. It's, it's actually, it sounds like high tech, but it's, it actually, it's more, it's more, it's, it's more low tech. In fact, in, in the way that it can be deployed and can be sourced, especially. So what, what's, what's your, yeah, I'd agree with that. Absolutely. Um, the the drones are a very cheap technology and i think ukraine was claiming they could essentially churn them out at a rate of 100 per day over the next year which is probably an exaggeration uh, but it does go to show just how much you can mass produce these things uh, now the the reports of these drones have called them shaheen drones uh, shaheen is the name of a drone which is actually of jordanian design and it's a kamikaze drone uh, or a suicide drone and the, now, the interesting thing to note, though, is that Shaheen is also, I believe, the Arabic word for falcon. So it might just be a generic word for combat drones. I don't speak Arabic, so I can't tell you, um, rather than that particular design. Uh, but if they are of Jordanian design, then I think that's an interesting feature to note. 
final thing is the drones which you may have heard a lot about in the Ukraine context are Shahed drones, which might sound similar, but they're a completely different technology. They're an Iranian drone that's larger and more expensive in general, as far as I'm aware. Now, the photo that I mentioned earlier is this. Uh, this, I believe, is Herat Tadir al-Sham in Aleppo. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's try you to can increase see the size of this a little bit. Just give me a second. Mm -hmm. I'll put you here. Yeah, can you describe it a bit more? Sure. So for anyone who's just listening, you have a bunch of what look like Arabic men in combat gear of all kinds, carrying assault rifles and wearing a mix of camo gear, baseball caps and protective helmets, standing in front of what looks to be uh, an anti-aircraft or uh, air defense system. And uh, I think what I noticed before is the GoPro slots and the helmets, which imply these are not prehistoric technology, they are at least reasonably modern. And when I've seen images of the Syrian Arab army, they look, they do not look better equipped than this. So I think it's fair to say that if this is representative of the Syrian rebels of HTS, then we're looking at two peer adversaries, at least in the terms of their infantry equipment, which is a limited guide to how effective they are overall. Um, but then, of course, this is a, a group of people who have just captured the city. You can expect they will have also looted a load of armaments or, which were left behind. They might have all just pulled these helmets straight out of storage, and this might be completely overrepresenting their general capability. So just a word of caution there. Right, right, but that's that's exactly the point that we that that a lot of people now will try to figure out also um, how how was it possible that this that that the Syrians didn't see it coming, right? I mean, as if this is a well prepared and a well mm. a well um, structured attack with good equipment, um, at least the forces in the region would should have had a certain kind of a certain kind of uh, information about this. This is the same thing that we wonder about with the attack, the Hamas attack on on Israel on mm -hmm. 7th of October 2023, right, in which leads a lot of people to speculate all kinds of things about this attack having been known or having been announced, but not being taken serious or it, like on purpose or not, whatever. But the, the question is, how are such large maneuvers possible without the other side actually being allowed to do it? Because again, you have to you have mm -hmm. to actually gather a lot of forces for this and a lot of equipment, which is something mm. that you would think that at least somebody as technologically advanced as the Russians, who are directly allied to the to Syria, would somehow in their surveillance pick up, but apparently, apparently not. That, that's a very good point. I think while the intelligence capabilities of Assad, Syria and Israel are completely incomparable, yeah in terms yeah. of technology and resources and financing and so on. You would at least expect the Russians to be slightly more on the ball with that. However, it's also worth pointing out that HTS and like many of the Syrian groups are by nature quite a dispersed military force. Um, and so it's perhaps more difficult to really pinpoint a military build up there. But we do know that the Russians were aware that something was happening because they stepped up their bombardment, their airstrikes in Idlib from as early as October. So it was clear they had some idea that something was happening. And indeed, airstrikes have continued throughout this, this phase of the conflict this last week in Idlib and other recently occupied rebel territories. The problem seems to be not in the air, though, but on the ground that the, the Syrians were unable for whatever reason to resist this attack, or perhaps, as you say, to predict it coming. Right. Um, the next the next point that I want to make, though, is that regardless of who you think may or may not be supporting HTS, and you would imagine they have to be supported by someone, this can't be a purely indigenous, self-directed assemblage of a military force. Militaries require a lot of a lot of economic support, if nothing else, just to, to operate. Um, it's worth pointing out that the only region which the Idlib province borders, apart from Assad Syria, is Turkey. So anyone who is supporting HTS, you would imagine they would have to be doing it with the tacit understanding of Turkey, right? Right, right. This is why, uh, in like other podcasters, like actually point their fingers to Turkey and the the influence of uh, Erdogan 
and the, mm -hmm. the possibility that this was basically Erdogan uh, taking revenge for like previous hu uh, humiliations by Russia. Um, that's one of the of the uh, uh, theories floating out there. Um, but I mean, how else would you get to these positions? Right, exactly. You'd have to anticipate some kind of Turkish involvement or at least uh, turning a blind eye if some other force were supporting HTS here. Mm. Sorry. <coughs> um, but yes, in case for those people who perhaps haven't followed Syria quite so closely, uh, it's worth pointing out that there's been a number of major Turkish interventions in Syria militarily. And uh, Turkey and Syria, their relation, I think, is really key to understanding how the Syrian civil war has developed. Because up until 2011, Turkey and Syria actually had very good relations. Um, at least as far as I'm aware, they, uh, they had reasonably fluid borders, they engaged in trade and cooperation on a number of international issues. But already by the end of 2011, Turkey had completely changed its stance towards the Assad government uh, and declared him more or less fallen into line with the rest of NATO in declaring him an illegitimate ruler, demanding regime change and actively supporting and financing the rebels in Syria. So that's a really interesting change of position there. Uh, what do you think on the geostrategic level might have informed that decision? This is it has to me been one of the of the great riddles, like how it was possible that Syria could fall apart so quickly. I mean, we know that Syria was on the chopping block when it came to like Western Western allies, but I to, I usually take Turkey. I, I think of Tur Turkey as separate. There, one of the big this like factors for um for turkey for erdogan was definitely the population and this 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 question of the kurds and the the visceral hate of erdogan towards the the kurdish the, the militant wing in inside turkey the p um pka mm -hmm. um and the also the kurdish representation inside 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 turkey and Actually, Erdogan is responsible for putting an, an end to kind of Kurdish-Turkish reconciliation, which then also, which was also represented by the fact that you had an entire Kurdish faction, a relatively big one, in the um, Turkish parliament, and you had a a political wing um, of the of the PKA that was that was presented there. And I, if I'm not wrong, it was in 2015 or so, or or even earlier that um that erdogan actually um basically dissolved even parliament and 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 started arresting these political figures uh, in order to prop up his own his own standing with mm -hmm. the with 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 it within turkey and then re-elections and actually undid a lot of the of the goodwill that happened that happened beforehand and then this this um the transnational nature of the of the kurds has has mm -hmm. been a problem for him forever and he started establishing like uh border zones inside syria buffer zones um which to my knowledge has been working quite well for turkey while not for syria and while uh, certainly also not not for the kurds and um so this geostrategic power game of trying to manage not only his own the the, the resentments that that Erdogan has, but also the the entire population control aspect of mm -hmm. of the of those border areas. I think must play a major role in the um, in in these decisions. Do you think that territorial or material gains are a major part in this decision or this strategy, or is it more about just control of those populations? I don't think that. I don't think that anyone except for these rebels, the moderate rebels, as the West calls the body, this, this very Islamist uh, fighting forces, except for them. I don't think that anyone has like serious territorial uh, ambitions. Sorry, I again must take like say like Israel aside of that, because of course, Israel occupies the Golan Heights, which is like mm -hmm. Syrian territory. But like, let's let's suppose that Israel is not a direct directly involved force in this that could win territorially um i haven't heard of any 
of anyone suggesting that Turkey might be interested in more land other than these border zones, these buffer, these buffer right. territories, also to put populations. So it's more a question of how to, for Turkey, it's more a question of how to create the 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 a security belt and a population mm -hmm. control belt around itself rather than trying to absorb more because again i mean if turkey started absorbing more peoples of these border areas it would be populations that it itself doesn't really welcome at least not the not erdogan's uh, nationalists mm -hmm. um they wouldn't actually want those people inside their 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 territories it's it's problematic enough that there is a large kurdish population that they need to manage in quote unquote of course i mean my quite sort of low level reading of the situation at the time was that maybe it was as simple as turkey didn't want to be on the losing side i mean they'd seen the writing on the wall for iraq earlier um and perhaps if they saw that if they expected Syria to collapse much more quickly than it did, and many of the regimes in so-called Arab Spring did collapse quite quickly, um, perhaps they weren't banking on the Syrian civil war lasting so long and thought that they might be better off siding with the West in its attempts almost to invade or to invade to intervene militarily directly in Syria more than they actually did. I mean, I mean, they did. Turkey did directly intervene, and there's there's oh, a question did, that yes, they are. But the West, yeah. I mean. Ah, ah, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint toward any any factions within the West within NATO who would be be primarily responsible for that. But we know that it fits within the larger design of the regime change operations uh, that really started from Iraq and then went over. Uh, over Libya and basically mm -hmm. um, took an end basically in Syria where the regime change was unfinished, right? I mean, Assad, Damascus was about to fall mm -hmm. and then it didn't mm -hmm. because of the large scale uh, pushback that especially the Russians were giving and the um, and then mm -hmm. stalemate is what that was reached. But to me, I mean, we know that there are still people in in Washington and in Brussels who think that Assad mm -hmm. needs to needs to go the same i mean needs to needs to 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 suffer the same fate as hussein and, uh, and gaddafi. gaddafi yes uh, in uh, my uh, recollection there were two major um, there were two major incidents where direct military intervention or at least a so-called no fly zone uh, was likely one of those being in 2013 after the guta chemical attacks and the other in 2016 um though i don't recall the exact details there i believe there was a vote in the UK Parliament regarding a, a no-fly zone in Syria and the imposition thereof. Now, I might be getting the dates slightly wrong there, but I seem to recall that we were very close. And certainly people I spoke to in the British Army at the time were convinced that the next place they were likely to be deployed was Syria. So I think we came very close there. Um, I just wanted to mention on the side of Turkey and and the inter its military interventions. So I found five I can recall five major military operations carried out by Turkey in Syria, which are Operation Euphrates Shield in 2016 to 17, Operation Olive Branch in 2018, Operation Peace Spring in 2019, Operation Spring Shield in 2020, and what's currently called Operation Dawn of Freedom, spearheaded by the Turkish backed SNA, which is happening right now. now there's a few things that I noticed about them. First of all, They've taken the classic Western nomenclature of calling what is effectively a military offensive by the most peaceful name that you can find. And seemingly the more offensive the operation, the more peaceful the name that's found for it, uh, which you can't help but laugh at slightly. Yeah, it would be, be, it would be, it would be hilarious if it wasn't so tragic that, that it's just like with the, 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 the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and so mm -hmm. on, um, those, the, these operations killed tens of thousands of people under yeah. the, and, under and the naming under the thousands. naming of peace and freedom right but okay sorry yes that's that's off the top no of absolutely and it's worth it's worth pointing that out and emphasizing that though one of the difficulties of covering this kind of material is it gets to the point where it, you a sort of trench humor settles in and i appreciate that that can seem um perhaps insensitive to people who are watching but i think you need something like that just to go through all of the material sometimes uh, a particular attention I want to draw 
to Operation Spring Shield, which was the last major military operation in Syria before the one happening now. That was in 2020. Essentially, a combination of Syrian and Russian forces were pushing the rebels back on all fronts in Idlib. And it was only the intervention of the Turkish military, the direct intervention of the Turkish army against the Syrian army, which stopped that offensive. And then the resulting discussions, negotiations between Erdogan and Putin resulted in the sort of frozen conflict which we had for the last four years. So I think that's particularly important that the reason HTS still survive in order to launch this offensive and take Aleppo is because the Turkish army intervened directly to save them four years ago. Right, right. Um, the, the 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 intricate web of these individual players is just um, um, it's just it's just huge. Also because there's a, so many of the smaller minor players, right, that still are managed to move um, considerably independently. Although the, the question then is always where do they get the money and the weapons from? Um, yes. Do you have? Uh, of course. But, but please. No, uh, I, I just want to move on because I'm aware this segment's taking up a lot more time than we expected because so much has happened. Um, it's worth pointing out that the big losers from this are not even Assad, although I'm sure his forces will have suffered a massive morale shock from losing Aleppo. I don't think any of them would have seen that coming. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how they can recover from this. Uh, but also Syria's northern Kurds have just seen their territory completely overrun by basically hostile forces. Uh, there was a report that tens of thousands of refugees who'd fled the earlier Turkish invasion of Afrin in that operation in 2020, and now trapped in the closed pocket at Tal Rifat, and basically stuck on the road outdoors with no water or food in freezing temperatures, waiting for a corridor so that they can go back to, um, to uh, not here, to Kurdish-controlled territory. So it seems that uh, another massive wave of displaced persons has been created by this operation. Yes, which will which will inevitably like create again pressure on Turkey actually, and the uh, and depending on how things go, then also on the European Union. But um, the the the, the mm -hmm. refugee streams from this from this fallout are not yet clear which direction they will move to. Yeah, that, that's certainly true. Uh, we should also mention what the West is doing here because I think it's always worth pointing out what the West mm -hmm. is doing because well. We are the West, and so we technically have more control, ideally, over what the West is doing than over what anyone else is doing, even if it doesn't work out that way. So I think it's fair to say that the West strategy around Syria, since they've been denied a public appetite for war and for direct military intervention, has been very sort of limited to try and cut off Assad's connections to Iran, to Iraq, and anyone who might support it. And that's why there's US military bases in the Kurdish region in the east. And recently, while this offensive was taking place, uh, the West wasn't, as far as I can tell, at all involved in the fighting in the northwest via airstrikes or anything like that. But they were involved in the east in bombing Deir and Azur and the border crossing to Iraq at Suwaya. There are also reports that elements of the Iraqi popular mobilization forces were sending their own units in possibly thousands, according to some reports, though again, none of this can be verified, across that narrow border crossing. And the, the West is actually in a very good position to interdict these. Uh, I'll bring up, the, bring up the map in a second. Precisely for the reason that they are uh, there's a single road, more or less a single highway leading from that border crossing up north and then carrying across from Deir Azur towards Damascus. And if you can't go directly across there because the Syrian desert is in the way. And so it's very easy for them to interdict that supply line. Um, so, sorry, I haven't got that map there. That was a mistake. No problem. Let's see. Um, you but, uh, so that was that's the West's involvement under the name of International Coalition. I don't think anyone has actually identified who owns the planes of the International Coalition, but I would suspect it's the America, the American Air Force or its proxies. That seems like a safe bet. Yeah, especially if there is any kind of valuable oil field nearby, as we know uh, well enough uh, before and after Donald Trump's comments about 
the, we've got the oil, we'll keep the oil. And we know that they've been smuggling out oil out of Syria for the, for the entire time, at least since 2016, if not 17. Well, the, uh, the, the Syrian the, oil, right? <laughs> but Yeah, the Kurdish region controls basically all of Syria's oil fields. And that's the region which is dotted with American military bases and boots on the ground. So, uh, yeah, it's very clear what America's priorities are in the region. Yeah, which is probably also an indication for why what is happening right now is, is, is happening over there in Aleppo and not anywhere near the oil fields. Because if it did, we already would have like NATO intervention and and uh, and, and more freedom storms and so on, trying to protect mm -hmm. their oil fields. Um, but maybe that's uh, too much cynicism at this point. Um, John, we are already uh, at 40 yes. minutes. I, I think we have to wind down this to first of here, our... Yeah first of our podcast is there anything to add from your point about this situation because you were just giving us the conclusion yes no I, I was just going to ask you about the predictions for syria as far as i can see without having a really granular understanding of what's happening on the ground it could go either way uh, there's i think there's potential for the rebels to push the syrians aside and go into Hama and perhaps beyond into homs certainly if they reach homs then we're already sounding the end of the assad government, even if not Syrian civil yeah. war. But equally, it could be that the rebels have extended and that when they encounter the more disciplined and better trained units of the Syrian army, such as the 4th Armored Division or the Syrian Republican Guard, that their successes will evaporate. So I don't know what's going to happen next, but I think possibly the least likely thing to happen is a stabilization on the current frontiers. No, this will there will be now necessarily a pushback. The big one, big question in my mind is: Is this all, and is Syria the primary target? Because as we speak, and we will probably go into this topic uh, next week, but mm -hmm. you know, there's another big crisis emerging, and that's Georgia, and um, the 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 government protests that are happening there, and which are anything but uh organic to as far as i can see and i will talk tomorrow uh, uh with uh, with um lasha kasarate about this but the if in syria you have now a a a very messy situation and you combine a messy situation in georgia which are both very important strategic places for russia mm -hmm. then there might be an element of of trying to put pressure on all of russia's allies small not allies sorry that's big, that's the wrong way i mean georgia is not an ally of russia the current georgian government is not an ally that is that is that's mm -hmm. just not 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 the case this is what the west tries to sell us but that's not the case but it is the point that this is a strategically important region and if if, if georgia was to experience a second maidan and and basically force the hands of the russians in terms of what they of, of how they control these these um uh, to uh, provinces, Georgian provinces, or maybe like even do more inventions there and, and bind Russian forces there, there might be a larger game going on that is that is as of yet not entirely, not transparent to as yet. But I am very suspicious at these timings of these things happening all at the same time. Lebanon ceasefire, Syria escalation, mm -hmm. Georgia uh, mass protests like Maidan type protests. Um, they... Uh, I, I am waiting for more information to come in, but actually maybe R Syria is not even the main target here. Maybe mm. the main target sits way more, way further north. And uh, on that note, I think we can conclude. Please let us know uh, your thoughts in the comments. We had planned to cover a bit more ground, but this is the first one of these we've done. And so it, we've got growing pains just trying to get everything sorted out. Please bear with us and we hope to bring you a more polished experience next week. But do let us know your comments, what you think of, of the new format and whether it's easy listening. And most importantly, what you'd like us to cover next, what things in international relations are important to you that you'd like Pascal's opinion and expertise on. And uh, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye from me. Thank you, John.